Good morning. It has been really great to be here. I've enjoyed our time over the last two days. I was able to hang out with uh, the elders from the church here last night and their wives, and that was really great. And uh, now I get to meet more of you and see you here in this church and worship with you, and it's joy. So thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, those of you who came to the to the workshop. And my prayer for you is that uh, we we together, because I'm still in this fight myself with with children and grandchildren, that we would do our work well. God will help us. God will help us. So here's my question for you this morning. How can we obey God? How can we obey God? I don't mean by that uh, what is the standard for obeying God. We know what the standard for obeying God is. It's, it's the word of God. It's the law of God, right? That's the, those are the the standards, the rules, the things that he calls us to do. That's not what I mean. I mean, how can we? It's one thing to have the law, you know, the rules, the commandments. It's another thing to be able to obey them. That's what I mean. How can we obey God? Scripture says that God is at work in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure, right? Which is exactly what we need. We need the motivation, the willing, right? If you're going to do something, you're going to do anything. You need two things, the motivation, the willing, and the power, right? The working to do anything. You needed uh, the will and the power to get up this morning and come. You could have wanted to, but not been able, or you could have been able and not wanted to, but you had both. For whatever reason, here we are, right? The will and the work, the willing and the power. How does God give us the motivation and the power, the willing and the doing to obey him? How does this work? The Bible tells us that God gives us everything we need for life and godliness in Christ. Everything we need for life and godliness in Christ. The core of our whole salvation, the center of everything that, everything good that God gives us as his children, the core of all of it is our union with Christ. Our union with Christ. And this is why, as we'll see, the Holy Spirit uses this phrase over and over again in Scripture. In Christ. In Christ. There's a lot to learn from the Bible about what it means to be in Christ, what it means to be united with Christ. But I especially want to focus on the relationship between our union with Christ and our ability to obey God. If you're a Christian... You want to obey God. How do we do it? Where do we get the strength? Where do we get the power? The power we have to obey God comes from our living, lasting, loving union with Christ. All the blessings that we receive from God from Jesus Christ, come only because of our union with him. What does that mean? How does the Bible talk about it? I'm going to go through all kinds of passages today. If you have your Bible, you can try to keep up. Go to Ephesians 1. I know that uh, Pastor Josh is going to start preaching through Ephesians 1 soon, a couple weeks. Not going to steal any of your thunder. Don't worry. You could spend weeks and weeks on this this passage I'm going to read. So Ephesians 1, it's going to start reading in verse 3. Look at how many times these words show up, in Christ, or in him, or with him. Look at it, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. 
just as he chose us in him. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in Christ. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us not which he meted out to us like a stingy Scrooge. He lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, having listened to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Now listen, brothers and sisters, just think. Think of the riches that the Father has lavished. That's the word. The riches that he has lavished on us. How? In Christ. In Christ. Election. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Adoption as sons, redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, the kind intention of his will, and inheritance, the sealing of the Holy Spirit of promise. None of that, none of that is yours apart from Christ. And scripture is filled with this kind of language. It's all over the place. Scripture uses this language of union with Christ more than 150 times in the New Testament. In Christ, in him. There's an old dead Dutch guy named Hervin Bavink, and he wrote this in his book, The Wonderful Works of God. Listen to this. It's so sweet. He says, For the believer united with Christ by faith, A series of benefits flow. Indeed, salvation itself. Salvation itself. Scripture mentions many of them. Calling, regeneration, faith, justification, forgiveness of sins, adoption as children, freedom from the law, spiritual liberty, hope, love, peace, joy, gladness, comfort, sanctification, preservation, perseverance, glorification, and others besides. What an amazing list. He says, the church as a whole and each individual believer in particular throughout all ages and in all circumstances, in prosperity and adversity, in life and in death, on this side of the grave and hereafter to all eternity, has received and will receive of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. Calvin says, John Calvin says it this way. When we are united to Christ, he dwells in us in such a way that everything that belongs to him is ours. Everything that belongs to him is ours. Would you just think about that? Christ keeps nothing for himself. Baving says, in Christ, the Father turns his friendly, gracious face to us. And that is all our salvation. It all depends on that. 
Christ keeps nothing for himself. Everything that's his is ours. This is amazing. This is incredible. This should fill our hearts with uh, wonder, with joy. Now, what do I mean by union with Christ? What does Scripture mean by union with Christ? What's it like? Let me give you some, some traits of our union with Christ. First of all, our union with Christ is covenantal. It's covenantal, right? Josh tells me he's been preaching a lot about how covenants work, You're kind of seeing that in the Old Testament. Our union with Christ, union with Christ language is covenant language. To be in someone is to be related to him as a covenant head, all right? 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22 says it like this. He says, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, what? All die, right? So also in Christ, all will be made alive. Everyone who is in Christ is made alive. So Adam was our covenant head in the covenant of works. He stood as our representative. This is how covenants work. The whole race would stand or fall in him, in Adam. And God would deal with us. God would deal with all mankind based on Adam's either obedience or disobedience, right? And since Adam broke the covenant of works in the garden, we all fell with him. And we all became liable as if we ourselves had broken that covenant. And so what? We all, we all what? We all die, right? But Jesus Christ is our covenant head in the covenant of grace. And he stood as our representative. This is what it means to be in him, to be in Christ. God deals with all who are in Christ based on Christ's obedience. And since Jesus kept the covenant of works perfectly, all the commands of God in, in act, in word, in thought, in motive, all the commands of God, all who are in Christ receive the blessings that come from that obedience. We receive the eternal inheritance. We receive life. We receive Righteousness, Christ's righteousness, imputed to us, credited to our account. This is what it means to be in Christ. What it means to be in Adam is to, be, to have his sin imputed to us. What it means to be in Christ is to have his righteousness imputed to us. So our union with Christ is covenantal, right? Second, our union with Christ is organic, the Apostle Paul uses the image of a body and its members, right? So 1 Corinthians 6, do, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ, right? 1 Corinthians 12, 27, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Think of that. Body of Christ language, it's all over the New Testament, Body of Christ language is union with Christ language. And of course, this organic unity, being united with Christ, body is personal and intimate. It's so personal and intimate that what is the, what is the image that Paul uses in Ephesians 5 for this? It's the image of the personal, intimate, one flesh union between a husband and his wife that's how intimate, that's how personal it is. Remember Ephesians 5? Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might prevent, present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies, right? He who loves his own wife loves himself. 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. Do you see that? That's the kind, that's the kind of union we're talking about. Intimate, personal, organic. Third, our union with Christ is a living union. It's a living union. Galatians 2.20, the Apostle Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I, my life, my very life is now the life of Christ. He gives me life. He lives in me and makes me alive, he says. In Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul says this, 1 to 4. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For, listen, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Just try. Just try for just a second to, to wrap your mind around that. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What does that mean? What is that like? That your life is hidden with Christ in God. I guarantee you, I don't know any of us who woke up this morning and thought, I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. Anybody? Is that what, is that what shapes the way you think about life, about your identity? This is true. He says this, when Christ, who is our life, what is your life? When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Our union with Christ is living. It's covenantal, it's organic, it's intimate and warm and personal, and it's living. This isn't just some uh, spreadsheet, you know, clipboard kind of union with Christ. It's not just theoretical, it's true, it's real. All of our life flows from him. So where does it come from? Where does it come from? What's its source? Scripture tells us that our union with Christ comes through the agency of the Holy Spirit. Right? 1 Corinthians 12, he says it like this. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. It's again, the body, he says, for even as the body is one and yet many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we are all made to drink of one spirit. It is not produced, this union with Christ is not produced by a, a ritual or a ceremony or a rite. It is a spiritual union produced and affected by the Holy Spirit, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 30. By his doing, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. This is his work. It's, it's, a, it's an incredibly gracious gift of God through his Holy Spirit to all who believe. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The Lord did this. It's his doing. What does union with Christ produce? What are its effects? What's the fruit of it in your life in real practical terms? 
Well, being united with Christ has radical effects on all who are joined to him. Radical effects. Our union with Christ is transforming. There are intensely practical and ethical consequences to our union with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, we're talking about union with Christ, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? A new creature, a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. If anyone is in Christ, this is what it means. This is the the practical effect of it. You are a new creature. In Christ, we partake of of new life. We are remade in Christ. We are remade in the image of Christ. The old things died. They've passed away. And behold, he says, new things have come. New things have come. Don't you think that has ethical consequences? Consequences on how you actually live your life, on your ability, on your willingness and your power to obey him. Absolutely it does. It all comes down to this. It all comes down to this. It is the only way that we can put aside our former manner of life. Remember your former manner of life? Sin, rebellion, deception, self-deception. Being hateful and hating. Remember the, the bondage to the lusts that you had? in your former manner of life? Remember all of that? Do you still remember it? Try to remember it. The only way we can put aside all of that and start living a new life of actual practical obedience to God, growing and growing and growing in the image of Christ, is because we've been united with Christ. That's it. The freedom of this, the the lavish grace of this. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, we haven't begun to even start to to grasp it. I'm sure of it. I know I haven't. The place where the Holy Spirit unpacks this the most in Scripture, I think, the connection between this newness of, of life, this union with Christ, and what are the benefits that flow to us from his death and resurrection and what that actually looks like for us in terms of power to obey. The place I think is the the clearest and the most helpful is Romans chapter 6. Look at it with me, okay? Turn turn there if you have your Bible. I'm just going to read it, make a few comments and go on, but we have to see Romans 6. We have to wrap our minds around Romans 6. I have been impressed in the past year with how important Romans 6 is and how so pitiful our grasp of it is. <laughs> so pitiful, speaking for myself. Look what he says, Romans 1, verse, or 6, starting in verse 1. He's just been explaining the gospel, justification, the free grace of God. It's not to the man who works, but to the, to the one who trusts him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is credited to him as unrighteous as righteousness. Uh, and he's like, okay, I've described the gospel, and I know what you're going to think. You're going to think that that means you can do whatever you want, right? Free grace, forgiveness of sins, it's all the work of Christ. Well, that means I can do whatever I want, right? Look what he says. What shall we say then? Are we to con- continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? What does he say is true of you? 
What does he say is true of you? You have what? You have died to sin. Or do you not know? Wait, he's saying what? You don't know this? You don't realize this? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's the catechism question. That's the, the effect of Christ's resurrection is that we rise, not just, we don't just rise from the dead, you know, on judgment day. We have now risen from the dead. We now walk, walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Why? In order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Brothers and sisters, I don't think any of us really believe that. I hope you do. I hope you do. We can read it on the page, right? We can check it down in theory. Okay, I know what it says. I guess it must be true. But... Do you really believe this? My old man has been crucified with Christ. He allows me to walk in newness of life. Freed from sin? I don't feel free from sin. Do you feel free from sin? Is this gobbledygook? He goes on. Look. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, you notice, in all these verses so far, that is the first command. Did you notice this? He's not commanding us to do anything up to this point. He's telling us what God has done. What God has done is he has united you to Christ. His death and his resurrection. And the only command we get so far is this one. What is it? Consider yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. What does that mean? You have to think right about yourself. You have to think the truth because it is true. He's not asking you, he's not saying this is true of you if you feel it. These are statements of fact. This is what Christ has done. This is what God has done for you in Christ as you're united with him. And then he says, now, come on, guys. This is the truth. Now, lodge it in your mind. Think rightly about yourself. You are dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the truth. He goes on. What do we do with that? He goes on, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
For sin shall not be master over you, for you not, are not under law but under grace. Brothers and sisters, look at this. This is the truth. This is the truth. What are we supposed to do with this? Here's what we're supposed to do with this. Start fighting. Start fighting. You have been united with Christ. Not only in his death, but in his resurrection. New life. Your old man has, in fact, been crucified. That's what he says. Body of sin done away with. Does that mean, oh, that means now I am sinlessly perfect. Is that what it means? No. Because what does he say? Verse 12. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign. You could let sin reign in your mortal body, even though you're united with Christ. It would be a travesty. <laughs> it is a travesty when we do this. We still sin, and yet what's different? What's different? Now we have life. Now we have power. Now we have the ability to walk in newness of life. Everything rests on this. Your sanctification, your hope of obe obeying Christ rests on this. Of course you couldn't do it before, but now you can. Not by your strength, but because Christ is in you. And you're in him. That's what it means when he says, for sin shall not be master over you if you're not under law but under grace. It doesn't mean the law has no purpose in your life anymore. It means you're able to now, by the power of Christ in you, to live according to his commandments. Sin shall not be master over you. I'm going to read a long quote, all right? I hate to read long quotes, but I'm going to read a long quote. And it's from John Murray. John Murray was a professor, a theologian, and in the early, mid-1900s. Uh, and he has some wonderful stuff on this. Here's what he says. He says, sin does not have dominion over the person who is united to Christ and who is under the governance of redeeming grace. Sin does not have dom dominion over him. This is but an implication of Paul's basic premise, we died to sin. He's talking about Romans 6, what we just read. And it is but another facet of the radical and decisive breach with sin, which is the consequence of union with Christ. The radical and decisive breach with sin that comes by our union with Christ. It is the facet, however, which brings to the forefront the aspect of power. Power. Sin is viewed from the angle of the power it wields, and breach with sin from the angle of deliverance from its power. When we die to sin, we die to its power. We must not dilute the force of this proposition. <laughs> oh, we love to dilute the force, you know, to water it down. Oh, well, no, that can't really vote it. That's just can't. Yeah, no, that can't be what it means. It means this is all what's going to happen when we die and go to heaven. Yeah, that's it. No, it's not. That's, that's crazy. That's not what he's saying at all. Right? He says there is decisiveness and finality. Sin does not rule in the believer. To think so is to deny the lordship which belongs to Christ by reason of his death and resurrection. And just as the deliverance from the power of sin is decisive, so it is inclusive. If the believer were under the dominion of, of any sin, then the truth of the proposition, sin shall not have dominion over you, would be abrogated, would be done away with, right? The deliverance in view must therefore apply to all sin. And the inescapable inference is that the sin which still inheres in the believer, in other words, yes, we do still sin, the sin which still inheres, clings to the believer, and the sin he commits does not have dominion over him. 
sin as indwelling and committed is a reality. Yes? It does not lose its character as sin. It is the contradiction of God and of that which a believer most characteristically is. Yes, we sin, but we sin against Christ, against God, and what Christ has made us in him. He says, it creates the gravest liabilities, <laughs> but by the grace of God, there is this radical change that it does not exercise the dominion. The self-condemnations which it evokes are the index to this fact. <laughs> it's a funny sentence. When you sin, when you sin, your conscience assaults you, doesn't it? If it doesn't, you're not in Christ. When you sin, your conscience assaults you. You condemn yourself, right? Why? That is a sign of your union with Christ. That ain't natural. The self-condemnations which it evokes, or sin evokes in us, are the index to this fact. It is the destruction of the power of sin that makes possible a realized biblical ethic. Okay, that's theologian talk. For you're able to fight your sin and obey God because of your union with Christ. Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul does exactly the same thing. You have died, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, we will appear with him in glory. And then he says this, Therefore, put to death the members of your earthly body. Immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. How can you fight your sin? How can you put your sin to death? Because you've been united with Christ. Take up the truth. Take up the truth that you have been freed from sin. And now fight your sin. That's the only way you can do it. It's the only way you can do it. Brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the power, the power that you have because of your union with Christ. Your union with him in his death and his resurrection. The power is not your own. It is entirely the power of Jesus Christ, but the power is yours nonetheless because of your union with Christ. To say that you have power does not make much of you. It is the power of Christ. To deny that you have the power is to diminish Christ. The New Testament is so full of this. <laughs> so full of it. And yet how easily do we brush it aside? We just brush it aside. We just decide not to notice this. We do. We think it's too good to be true. We think, wait a minute, but I still sin, so this can't be true. And you know why we still sin? It's because we don't think it's true. I'm not talking that we have sinless perfection, no. But we have the power to fight. If we didn't, if we didn't have the power to put to death our immorality, our impurity, our greed, then why would he tell us to do it? He has given us the power in Christ. Listen, I'm going to, okay, something preachers shouldn't do, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you uh, a barrage of Bible, and then I'll be done, okay? This is Ephesians 1, 15 to 23. Listen for the terms. Keep your ears open and listen. He says, for this reason, I too, having heard of the faith 
in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, here's what he's praying for us, right? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. <laughs> okay? So this is his prayer. This is something we should pray for ourselves and for one another. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. He wants, he wants you to know this. What kind of power, Paul? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What kind of power is it, Paul? It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at God's right hand. This power is yours. I'm not making this up. He wants you to know it, the surpassing greatness of his power that's toward us who believe, the power that raised Christ from the dead. Here's another one, Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. Another prayer. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory that will never run out, that he would grant you freely, according to the riches of his, of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. This is something to pray for, that you would be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now, seriously, when you read this, what do you think? Do you think anything? Do you think... I believe, I believe, I believe. That sounds strange. I don't know what that means. Let's move on. Is that what you think? Here's another one, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him, now listen to this, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He is able to do more in you than you can possibly imagine. That's what he's saying. This isn't some weird Pentecostal, like, strangeness. This is the word of the living God. He is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations. In Philippians, the, the Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, talks about the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, Philippians 3. He says, I want to know Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. 
There it is again, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He says it again in Colossians 1, 9 to 12, another prayer. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we've not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects. Isn't that what you want? Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. How strong is Christ? How strong is he? Is he stronger than your sin? Oh, has he met his match in you? Is he stronger than your sin? Strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. <laughs> Moms, we had a parenting conference. Do you sometimes feel a little impatient with your kids? What do you need? You need the strength of Christ. What do you have? The strength of Christ working in you for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. These aren't just frilly words. These aren't things that apply to you once you're dead <laughs> and glorified. This is for now. This is for you. This is what it means to be united with Christ. The power that we have in Christ is the heart of the Apostle Paul's understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Brothers and sisters, do you believe this? Do you believe this? If you believe this, it will show in how you use it. Or maybe you've literally rejected the word of God for fear of being called a charismatic or whatever else it might be, you know, for fear of the hundred ways that someone might possibly abuse or misuse or misunderstand this truth. The Apostle Paul warned us about people like that, people like us who are scrupulous with the form of godliness scrupulous with learning and scrupulous with the outward forms of godliness, the worship, the liturgy, the man-made traditions, but who deny the power of God. He says that in 2 Timothy 3. He says, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, brothers and sisters, there are times when we live in that list. And he says this, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. They've denied its power. Nope, I'm in bondage to sin. I'm totally depraved after all. And I'm in bondage to sin. And my, my only release, my only hope for ever having any progress is actually when I'm dead. That's not what the Bible says. He says these men are always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? 
If you're not in Christ, you have no part in his death on the cross to atone for your, for your sins, no share in his resurrection from the dead. If you're not in Christ, you're not justified, you're not adopted, you're not sanctified, you're not, you will not be glorified. Are you in Christ? Do you know him as your head, as your life? Do you know him and the power of his resurrection? Do you have a living, lasting, loving union with him? One flesh, member of his body. Do you have any power against your sins? Do you have any power against your sins? Newness of life. Are you taking hold of all that Christ has for you? All that Christ is for you? Remember, everything that Christ has is yours. Everything that Christ has is yours. Everything pertaining to life and godliness is yours. That's what the Bible says. This is how you can obey God. This is how you can do the things that are pleasing in his sight. You must be in Christ. And being in Christ is the free gift of God. By his doing, you're in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ? If you're in Christ... Are you taking hold of everything that he has for you? Power against your sin. The first thing that Paul says in Romans 6 is consider yourself. Put it in your brain. It is true. Now act on it. Pick up the promises of God and use them to fight your sins. Use his promises to obey his, his commands. This is glorious. It's true. It's true. Let's pray together. Dear Lord God, please open our hearts to understand the scriptures. Open us up. The things that we have read and talked about that seem fuzzy and strange and foreign and too good to be true. Oh, Lord God, please. By your spirit, make us know the truth. Make us know what seems unknowable by the power that you have given to us, please, we pray. And help us to live for you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.